Hey there, you're watching Picture This, and this is our photography podcast. It's a long format. You can listen to it using your favorite podcasting app while you work out or edit photos or whatever. Or you can watch it on YouTube. But don't complain that it's too long, because that's the whole point. It's not going to be long today. Because today we're talking about the worst photography inventions. You've all seen them. We may as well have a little laugh about them. And we're doing a countdown, because I guess that's fashionable. Yeah, we, we review a lot of garbage. So this is kind of our opportunity to really complain about some of the stuff we've used before and some stuff that goes way back. But first, many decades. The Great Courses Plus is sponsoring this podcast today. The Great Courses Plus hosts video training from all sorts of professionals, not just a knucklehead like me, but an Ivy League professor or someone super cool like Neil deGrasse Tyson. I've watched some of his videos. You can get a free trial at thegreatcoursesplus.com slash Tony, and that'll give you a free month of that sweet, sweet learnings. Thanks, Great Courses Plus. Coming in number seven was the Vivicam. This is a camera from the 90s, a digital camera, one of the, the first 90s. digital cameras. Yeah. And it was garbage. It was just garbage all around. When you look at the reviews, people hated and everything they hated about looking it. at it the image quality the way it felt and yeah the design was pretty ugly Pink. too so women will like photography but the biggest flaw do better with this thing is it stored its pictures in what's called ram and i've you, heard of it yep yeah, if you took it's a woolly mammal it took double a AA or triple a batteries depending on the model and if you say ran low on batteries it would it would lose all your pictures. So you could be on vacation. You could be enjoying your family, getting pictures of Susie's first time at Disney, and then your battery runs out, and all of those pictures are gone. But wait, you're proactive. You see the batteries running low. You go to change your batteries. Nope. Still, so you took the batteries out. All your pictures are gone. What? <laughs> yeah, you could not change them back. You would have to unload the pictures to your computer and then swap the batteries out. Because it lost everything every single time you tried to change the batteries. <laughs> what a piece of garbage. What a terrible design this was. Yeah, yeah. This is one of those things. Well, what was the whole point? Like, what was the selling point of this camera? That it was small or something? Yeah, just small, cheap, digital camera. It's awful. <laughs> Who would design something like that? It's an affordable way to never see your pictures again. I can barely charge my cell phone, so I would have... Had no pictures to show. Yeah. Number six is the selfie stick. Because if I go to one more tourist attraction and get bopped on the head with the selfie stick, I'm going to go cray. Um, uh, this is one of my favorite pictures here. You added this. It's a shot of from south some t side some tourist location. And they have two things you can't do there. No, no selfie weapons. sticks and no weapons. In it, that order. Selfie stick is basically a weapon at times. A weapon against my body. A weapon against my eyes. They look horrible. Uh, they're in the way all of the time. And we don't really need to see more selfies. No, and they make selfies that much more annoying. Selfies are annoying anyway. Yeah. But when you now need to take up like 10 square feet around you as you're, when you're swinging like, this thing around. Like telescoping a stick and then you're all smushing together. It's just like... Just ask Tony. That's what everybody else does. We're making fun of these now. Wait until the selfie drones come out and suddenly there's little spinning blades around every major tourist attraction. I know I'm going to get one of those caught in my hair. Just emotionally preparing myself now. Okay. Oh, this one really broke my heart. You were the, so excited the about the camera. Because I was very, very excited. It, it was a very novel idea. Very cool. It was supposed to be able to take a picture and then you could choose the focus after not something I typically really have a problem with, but I just like the idea. And they showed all these cool effects, like you could create animations where it could move back and forth because it seemed to see, see in 3D. And it cost like $2,000 or more. It was like highly specialized, super high tech. Know. And we were just sure it was the future. Like focusing is done. We'll always be able to focus. In I was like on board. Mm -hmm. Let me on this Lytro train and I don't want to get off. Well, I was wrong. And so were they. Oh, what were your impressions of this Lytro loom? Well, it's a beautiful design. So it holding it and taking pictures with it was pretty cool. The user interface was pretty cool. The end result did not work out. But wait, remember it would just crash all the time? Crash. Like bad computer crash. Like we had to, multiple times during the review, we had to take the battery out. 
and let it sit for a few seconds and then put the battery back in just to get it to start up again. We were forgiving because it was a very new product. Uh, we got it a couple of years after that thing came out. We got it a couple of months before the company went bankrupt. I yeah. think that's probably why, the, why they finally started sending it to the press, like some last ditch effort They're to like, raise some funds. Maybe like, might as well get reviews. <sighs> what um, did you think of the final pictures, though? I told you. Trash. Garbage pile. Flaming garbage pile. Yeah, the image quality, maybe it was two or three megapixels pixels worth. Pickles? <laughs> megapixels. Mm, somebody's hungry. <laughs> like Kevin Raver. <laughs> um, they were so obviously blurry it looked like nothing was in focus and we tried putting pictures on instagram and people would be like why is it blurry even on instagram people thought this mm. piece of garbage camera was making blurry pictures but i figured out that it was all a lie the whole thing was a lie life just this camera but oh. yeah i mean virtual worlds and all that we'll get to that later <laughs> But it was supposed to be able to, like, seeing things from multiple angles so we could peer around stuff. And I got deep into the software trying to make this work, and all of it was fake. It just it looked like the software would just try to figure out what was sharp and what wasn't sharp, and that's how it would do its depth mapping. And then it would use, like, a terrible version of content-aware fill to fill in areas behind subjects. But it was, it was just all a lie. It was all done in software, and they did a terrible job at that. It was the worst Wow, you are really fired up. People say I you're chill, this camera. but today I'm not saying that. Well, no, they lied to people and they were charging them thousands of dollars for it. Do you think people bought it? Oh, yeah, people bought it. People still buy these because you can buy them for a couple of hundred bucks and some people still have some old memories of how being excited about this text so they still end up buying it. Oh, no. They're like, oh, how can I pass up for 200 bucks? Like, enjoy rebooting that thing and just getting mad. They may as well get the Vivitar. At least you get to take pictures until your AA batteries run out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. At least you don't have to worry about loading them onto your computer. This one is so fun. Th this one, okay, yeah. You almost love to hate it. I, I love to hate it, but I love to love it, too, honestly. Mm -hmm. And it's called the Minolta Talker. kind of tells you everything you need to know. It's a camera that talks to you and tells you what to do so that you can presumably take better pictures. What a sad world we live in. Chelsea, I don't, you probably don't have intense memories of the 80s like I do. I do. But during the 80s, like talking was everything. Oh, like there was, Kit? Yeah, I was going to say Night Of Rider. course you were going to say dun, Kit. Dun, dun, dun. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, if you bought a new Pontiac Fiero and you left the door open, it would be like, door ajar. Door ajar. And everybody's like, oh, it's so high tech, even though there was just a little cassette tape. <laughs> playing back How and is forth that the future? Loop. I've never been like, I hope in the future more things talk to me. That's not my future, folks. Oh, man. So this Minolta camera, we'll play a video clip, but it would just be like, too dark. Too dark. <laughs> Why would you want your camera saying that? That's racist. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it was referring to skin tone so much as exposure. No, I'm pretty sure it was racist. Justin, it was a different time. roll that beautiful racist footage. <laughs> I'm with the remarkable new Minolta Talker. When the light's too dim, it talks to you. Too dark, use flash. When you're out of flash range, it tells you. Check distance. And when the camera's empty? Load film. It's the auto exposure, auto focus, 35 millimeter camera that loads, advances, and rewinds the film all automatically. The new Minolta Talker talks you into good pictures. Great pictures. Only from the mind of Minolta. I wish you could program it to just say whatever you wanted, like if you could hack it and then troll your dad. Be like, you're a jerk, Dave. He'd be like, dang it. First Susan, now this. Or <laughs> well, maybe like ways you could put in celebrity voices like James Earl Jones. Oh, yeah. Move closer. Ooh, Tony. Oh, hey, you got pretty the good, sexy right? Tony. <laughs> oh, the Minolta talker, a piece of garbage. I want from one the for 80s. Christmas. Oh, what? Yes. I want to do this where it's I give bad. you one of these terrible cameras and you just have to review it. But I have to spring it on you. Like we have to be on vacation or someplace beautiful where you really want to take pictures. And then I spring a garbage camera on. I like when to... I'm very ornery because I'm working hard at my desk and you pass me something and I'm like, grumble, grumble, garbage. <laughs> I mean, OK, number four, crappy light modifiers. Oh. We're trying to avoid using brand names here. No, no, it's. I mean, yeah. There's because there's a lot of crap. But there's a lot of, the of them. We don't so want to single anything. There's no out. need to single it out. Uh, it's just like, <clears throat> first of all, on-camera flash is not good anyway, and there's not much you can do to 
to fix that. But then people take their flash and there's all sorts of modifiers. I, f I found a few that I like, but a lot of them are garbage and can be replicated easily with some paper or Tupperware. Yeah, or like or a little $10 diffuser cap. Works just great. Or you can just bounce the flash. That mostly gets the effects. Do you but think, I think you could use a white cat? <clears throat> yeah, I like to put a white cat right on the end of my... <laughs> I'm just saying, if you want views on YouTube, you'd take more of my ideas. Um, I, the real issue I have with these crappy light modifiers is that some of them will charge $150. Like that one that we reviewed, the kit was $150. So a lot of money for not a lot of results. And you strap this thing onto your flash and... Remember that one test shoot that we did? We just had to do some corporate headshots and we decided we would try this thing out. And our headshots, we were shooting them vertically. And every time we turned the camera vertically, the big weight on the flash head would cause the flash head to rotate down, pointed straight at the ground because the flash head didn't that have enough right. resistance. I forgot to hold about it that. You have a good memory. This is big, heavy, ugly looking thing. And it looked so goofy because it was like this big sphere on top of the flash. Oh my God, it was terrible. And it just, it burned through our flash batteries because it doesn't send the flight in any controlled or useful way. It just like wastes your light. It flashes all this light like behind you or into your chest or something. That's like, why me and my friend David invented the flash blocker. It's just an all black piece of plastic you put over your flash for when there's too much flash. And we're only charging $99.99. Oh, that's a relative bargain. It's a good deal. Uh, the marketing on these things is also appalling because they'll always show these before and after pictures. This is from Jim Harmer. Yeah, Jim Harmer, my friend at Improve Photography, did a friend. whole article about him where he took one of these $150 things and then compared it to uh, sticking Tupperware on top of his flash. And the results are indistingu indistinguishable. <laughs> they produce exactly the same results as a 99 cent piece of Tupperware. You know what? I don't think you should undervalue Tupperware because I never have enough. This is true. And people take it because people love it. Okay, before we go on to our next one. Oh, you have more. Oh, just another, just a joke, a meme, <laughs> where somebody's making fun of these flash diffusers and the <laughs> lies that they tell when they are marketing them. For the most part, you could get these better results by bouncing the flash, <laughs> just point the joke. flash at the ceiling. Oh, That's so pretty funny, Tony. Overpriced, misleading marketing, piece of garbage. You are just full of it today, sir. You're fired up, you're angry as all heck, and you know what, quite frankly, you've lost your chill. And I'm going to get you more for Christmas. You want to see how a pro does a segue, Chelsea? Check this out. You know what's not garbage? The Great Courses Plus. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Impressed. Tell me more. The Great Courses Plus offers real video training, whereas YouTube has mm, free stuff We're from great, but... people like us. They offer proper courses from real professionals. I'm a real professional. Like they have an amazing series of courses from National Geographic, including a Masters of Photography from National Geographic, where 20 different photographers talk about their shooting style. These are deep and I love to go through them. They have a lot that anybody at any level can learn from. You actually got me one for Christmas and I liked it a lot. They've over did. eight. Before we had a sponsorship. Before we had a sponsorship. I paid for it. It was Neil deGrasse Tyson's science thing because we love science. And then we watched together at night and we said, wasn't this a good educational idea? There are over 8,000 videos, but the ones that we're excited about right now are, are their photography videos. They have all sorts of lectures, including the fundamentals of photography, and they have a series about National Geographic Masters of Photography from all different types of photographers. If you want a one month free trial for free, go to thegreatcoursesplus.com slash Tony. You can click on the description below to start today. It's free. <laughs> Thanks, the great course. Free fun. is free. They also have this cool feature with audio streaming so you can listen to it if you're driving, but then if you go back to watch the video, it picks up the video at the same spot. That's cool. That makes learning fun. That makes learning easy. But number three, we got a suggestion from Jordan Drake. One from of my two best friends at the camera store. <laughs> I love the camera store, guys. You should check out their YouTube channel as well because they're pretty great. Um, and he said PC sync port, which I didn't even think of until he said it. And then Rage came to me. <laughs> yeah. Rage. They are always coming unplugged with our old lighting setup. We used to have to use the PC sync port and it was always falling out. Well, not everybody knows what this is. But back in the olden days, if you wanted to fire an off-camera flash, 
you had to run a cord, like a little wire from your camera over to the strobes or to a box that controlled your strobes. I know. And it was the flimsiest piece of crap ever. It would just fall out all the time. And whenever it would fall out, the whole shoot would stop. Anyway, this 100-year-old port is still on all major pro cameras, and it's still a piece of garbage. But on the upside, we can like take our Mamiya and stick it into any major, any modern flash system and pretty much trigger it. So That's an upside, but they could just make it threaded. Yeah, how did they... Oh, what a piece of garbage. Ted Forbes suggested disc film. Ted Forbes, another Grady in my book. Yeah, back in the 80s when 35 millimeter film was popular, you know, 35 millimeter film would come on these rolls. So as a result, all your cameras had to be fatter than these rolls. So they were, your cameras were a little fat. And this I had no idea what this was. I had never heard of this before. It's ugly. It, it's, you can just look at it and see that it's a flawed idea. Yeah, so they made this film that was like a disc. And it had 15 frames out on the radius of the disc. And yeah. you would, it had this little cartridge and you put the cartridge into your camera. So it was kind of easier to load. You didn't have to pull the tab out. But it um, had such severe penalties. You know what it looks like. What are those things? The little red toy. And you put the round film in and then you look through it. The oh, look, what is that, a Viewmaster? A Viewmaster. Yeah, it looks exactly like a Viewmaster. That's it's where they got the like idea. That. So just... yeah, every time you took a frame, it would rotate. And mm -hmm. But... Uh, it's smaller than 35 millimeter film. Yeah, so your pictures would be terrible quality, garbage quality. Also, whereas 35 millimeter film was like common and standard, this was proprietary. So guess what? They got to charge you a whole bunch. And then they got to charge you a whole bunch more during the processing. And it was pretty hard to find at times. Also, Ain't you could have a camera America. that was a little bit thinner. Instead of 36 <laughs> frames, you got 15 frames on it. And you got to pay more for all this. <laughs> wow. And all idea. to be an early adapter. Just so you could get a camera that you could like stick in your pocket or something. The number one in our mind, I didn't know it existed until today, but then Chris Nichols came in like the beautiful man angel that he is, and he put it on our Twitter. So shout out to you, Chris Nichols. It's called the Photo Sniper, and it's exactly what it sounds like, and it makes zero sense, and it scares me. It makes your camera look like a gun. Which is fun if you're photographing kids for school. <laughs> it's great if you want to cozy up with grandma or if you're doing street photography, but you also want to get arrested and maybe shot to death. It's a terrible idea. Yeah, it literally has a exactly like a gun trigger on it. You mount it to the bottom of a telephoto lens and then it also has a gun stock. So it looks it is exactly like the bottom part of a rifle. Yeah. Except you stick your camera and telephoto lens on the top. It's like... My hobby's too peaceful. How can I appear more aggressive? Uh-oh. Kid Rock got one. Yeah, we have a picture of a guy here who actually customized it. He put like a very nice wood stock on it and everything. Oh, that's a wood stock? Yeah, this guy really took some Is that care. a bird's eye maple? Is uh, it a burl? A burl of maple? It is beautiful and scary all at the same time. Wow, no, he was peaceful, I think. It, it's just so crazy because wow. big telephoto lenses intimidate people anyway, but just put it on a gun. <laughs> My goodness. And I bet this person that bought it is like, why doesn't anyone ever hire me a second time for family photo shoots? I just don't get it. You definitely They're run jealous. a real risk of getting yourself shot to death <laughs> when you use this thing. Yeah. Can you imagine just walking around with this? Somebody's going to see you. I mean, I'm from Texas where we don't take kindly to just waving guns around like that. I thought you did. I thought that was the whole point of Texas. No, man. People have etiquette about it. They keep their guns holstered. But with this, you just be walking around etiquette. with it on a sling. They don't pull it out unless you cut them off in traffic. And that's called manners. <laughs> I know this because I handed a gun to Justin one time. And he's from the Southwest. He knew how to handle it. He kept it pointed away from people. You hand a gun to somebody from Connecticut and they go, they immediately look down the barrel and they point it right at you. People in Texas know how to handle guns. Pardon me. Pause the podcast. What is your experience with that? Because I know how to handle a gun. You you point it right at the heart. Because if you're going to accidentally <laughs> shoot someone, you don't want them being mad. Empty the clip. Empty the clip. I trained with the pros. Okay, so that wraps Wait, it up. Have you ever learned how to shoot a gun? Yeah, I went through the whole process to get my license in Connecticut. I grew up with rifles and handguns and stuff. I grew oh. up with hand grenades. Connecticut's different. <laughs> anyway. 
So that was the number one worst thing we could find ever. I'd love to hear people's suggestions. You can write a comment down below for what the worst thing you had an experience with was. But I also wanted to go through some honorable mentions because there were so many pieces of garbage that we've seen in the last few decades. So much beautiful garbage and not enough time. Can I just say I bought a Canon Elan 2E, which had eye-controlled autofocus points where you could yeah. use your eye to control the autofocus so point. So you put your eye in the viewfinder and then you look around like that? Yeah, but it, it didn't work well at all. And you'd be trying to use your eye, so you'd be trying to take a <laughs> portrait of somebody, and then your eye would just be like moving all around, <laughs> and you'd be like looking up and down trying to make the stupid thing work, and can it wouldn't you, work. Can you imagine that combined with the little rifle thing? You'd just be a creep <laughs> on the street. <laughs> People would be like, there's a guy with a, a camera gun, and he's real creepy. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, there's a reason your 5D Mark IV doesn't have that. It sucked. <laughs> it was never going to work. Uh, shout out to the Sony memory stick for taking uh, very common SD card formats for memory cards that were available very cheaply and making it proprietary while adding absolutely no benefits except much, much higher prices. I sense some sarcasm. Yeah, well, if you ever owned a Sony camera back in the era when they had these proprietary things, you'd be pulling your hair out. You'd be paying like five times more for SD cards. And getting nothing. Still better than that little viewfinder film, my gadget. <laughs> Maybe so. Uh, Jordan also suggested the Minolta hot shoe because Minolta, rather than using the standard hot shoe that everybody used for flashes, they had to make up something proprietary. They had to be to... a hot shot with the hot shoe, and it got you on the list. So and then Sony that? inherited that when they bought Minolta. So we had these Sonys that had proprietary memory cards and proprietary flashes. Sony's dropped that stuff. They know Sony's what they're doing. Sony's learned. They're, they learn. Who remembers flash cubes? I don't. Justin? Yeah, you I was I was pretty young, but yeah. You'd get like four flashes out of it. You put it on top of your camera and it would fire and it'd be like and it would get like super hot and everybody would be blinded and then it would rotate. <laughs> Sounds fun. They just sucked. Um all uh, Wi Fi apps. Yeah, especially I'm afraid early of the apps. anger that's gonna come out of you with this one. Uh, some recent Wi-Fi apps have gotten better, but if you look at the reviews of all camera Wi-Fi apps, they all have like one and a half, two stars in the app store. Really? With one being the lowest. I don't know why no camera manufacturer has made managed to make a decent Wi-Fi app. Let's do it. <laughs> I'm not taking that one. I have nothing to do tomorrow. Let's get it done. <laughs> um, it would be like made with crayon. Um, auto levels. Yeah, this is for the video nerds, but by default, pretty much every camera will adjust the levels based on the ambient noise. But that what happens is when there's any any silence, it'll crank the volume up. So you'll be talking and then shh, and then you start talking again, it's it drops beautiful. back down. So like every bit of silence is filled with this noise. gradually amplified noise as it searches to make the sound louder. Like a building tsunami wave. That's yeah, that's officially how they refer to that. <laughs> Um, the Mavica floppy and CD cameras. I saw pictures of those and they were pretty ugly. They looked like a disc man with a lens on it. Yeah. People didn't like having to connect their camera to, to a USB cable to load pictures on their computer. So they wanted just to write it directly to a big, big old floppy disc or what they, CD. What were they taking advice from like their emails? Like some guy was like, I want a CD. And they were like, let's do it. Let's take a shot. <laughs> oh, and the CDs were not standard CDs. They were those little mini CDs. You know, they look, you'd have to put them in an adapter those thing anyway. Did you used to have the little mini cassette tapes that you had to put in a bigger cassette tape to make it play? No, I didn't know that that existed. That's what all my home movies are on. Oh, what is it? Like VHSC? Mm, I think so. Oh, yeah, I remember that. It's cool. I wish we still had those. It's like a Russian doll of technology. <laughs> and I'm feeling it. What's your last thing here? Uh, the Canon EOS barcode scanners, you could hook uh -oh. this barcode. Again, this is like an 80s they thing. They let a marketing person into the into the engineering meeting. Back when barcodes were new and cool, about the same time when we had stuff that started talking for no good reason. <laughs> <laughs> that You could hook up this barcode scanner and then they would give you a big book of different scenarios like low light portrait. And it had 101 different photography scenarios and you could flip through the book and find your scenario and pull out your barcode scanner and scan the barcode and then it would put the settings into your camera 
That's awesome. <laughs> it's garbage. <laughs> what a terrible That's idea. Cool. So you're supposed that. to carry this book around with you everywhere. That's and say, dope. Excuse me, I'm gonna need to take a Pardon picture, but me. first I got uh, this is I think this is like a number fifty seven, maybe fifty. Oh yeah, I'll have a fifty seven with a Ding. small coke. <laughs> but don't <laughs> these are great. I want all of them. All this photography garbage has been brought to you by <laughs> The Great Courses Plus. They have a lot of videos that are better than the stuff you see on YouTube. Real courses taught to you by masters. And you can get it for free if you go to thegreatcoursesplus.com slash Tony. At least you can get a trial, see if you like it. But I bet you will. I bet you'll want to stay signed up. Yeah. Click the description down below. You'll get that one month free trial. And thank you, The Great Courses Plus, for making this episode possible. I like talking about junk, but you're great. Great Courses Plus. And don't forget, if you watch this on YouTube, check us out in your podcasting app, because that's the whole idea. You can listen to us while you're driving or something. Yeah, stream it. Justin told me that's better for us. Thanks, Justin. Okay. Bye, Bye guys. <laughs>